we're trying to get to a point where feeding 9 billion people at 2050 needs to be sustainable. And in order to do that, we need to have sustainable crops that are not taking from the planet health, but actually helping sequester things like um, uh, carbon dioxide from the environment. The reality is, is that the, the, the easiest way to do that, and I know you've seen the great documentary called Kiss the Ground, um, yep. um, which goes into detail on this, is, is essentially by growing plant crops that can help. You know, leaving um, uh, crops in the ground, less tilling, less water usage, um, and ultimately more soil health, which means that we need to use less land to grow more volume to feed more people. And like, it's incredibly simple, but the practices that are going on in the agriculture community because of the lack of education are the opposite to this. In the US in particular, there's approximately 40% of all fresh produce bought in the store is thrown in the bin, um, which is absolutely disastrous. And if you buy frozen vegetables to replace those fresh vegetables, you're getting the nutrition but you're also taking an average of a pound of fresh food waste out of the waste system. So it's basically one for one on replacement of um, making a difference to to food waste and planet health. The big retailers are great at following what the consumer trend is because they have the data to understand what's important to their shopper base. And that's, that's what they exist to be, you know, to serve the consumer. If you look at Waitrose and Sainsbury's, for example, they've created a B Corp aisle because they know that that's important to their consumers. So can an aisle become a supermarket? Well, if the aisle or the section didn't exist before, then why not? Um, In terms of timing, uh, you know, I think it becomes about when things start getting complicated for us in terms of global temperature. These things are warning signs of change and you know unfortunately we as a race of people don't do anything until it's right in front of us and causing a problem i have a a fantastic thought leader uh, being interviewed today his name is sam dennigan and he's from strong roots hey sam how you doing Hey, Anand. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. And I know we've been discussing for a while and it's been great having uh, these chats with you and great to have you on the show, especially that you're such a leading authority now in the world of frozen food. Uh, and we're going to be hearing some more about that. And I was really happy that you also got your B Corp status and I'm also a fan of your products. There, some of your potato fries in my freezer right now. Awesome! Thanks for the custom. Keep that freezer filled. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So let's uh, let's let's talk about that. I mean, um, a couple of years ago, I did have this debate with with my wife about you know um, fresh food and and frozen food, and then she was saying, yeah, it's always great to buy frozen because it packs the nutritional value. And, and I always thought, well, does it, I thought it might lose stuff, but she's right. You know, it does pack a lot of nutritional value, but there's also a big thing about food waste right now. And obviously we have to be careful about what we're buying and make sure we're consuming that. So it'd be great to, I guess, just start with that point. And actually, um, if you can sort of tell us a little bit more about why it's good to have frozen, you know, fresh, freshly picked veg. Absolutely. Um, they, they are the two main benefits of, of frozen foods. You've, you've hit the nail on the head. So, um, you know, the first being kind of wrapped around the technology of IQF, which is individually quick frozen, which basically means that when you pick whole vegetables off the field, um, it's possible to immediately freeze those to lock in all the nutrition that's there, as opposed to shipping them in the fresh market, which over a case of you know six to eight weeks basically there's degradation on on the nutrition that's in there and by the time it reaches your local supermarket in the fresh aisle it's got much less nutrition in um than it did when it came off the plant um and that's been you know a scientifically proven case for years i think the initial research on that was done on frozen peas um 
probably by the likes of Bird's Eye or one of the companies that it benefits. And um, we're actually looking at a similar type of research at the moment to prove that against root vegetables and all the things that are in uh, the strong roots range. Um, the second thing, as you rightly mentioned, is about food waste. Um, we did a study a couple of years ago, which basically revealed that in the US in particular, there's approximately 40% of all fresh produce bought in the store is thrown in the bin, um, which is absolutely disastrous. And um, if you buy frozen uh, frozen vegetables to replace those fresh vegetables, you're getting the nutrition, but you're also taking an average of a pound of food waste, of fresh food waste, out of the waste system. So it's basically one for one on replacement of um, making a difference to, to food waste and planet health. Um, so buying frozen is is um, is definitely a benefit. Now the reality is is that people people's perception of fresh produce is never going to change. Um, but you know, having as we talked about previously, that backup in the freezer for those times when you're looking to manage portion control or you just don't need a whole head of broccoli or you just don't need a whole bag of potatoes. Um, buying frozen is the perfect answer to those those situations. Yeah, for sure. And and it's it's definitely about convenience if it's already, you know, cut to the right sizes, etc. Of course. Well, I mean, look, we've we've become a, a a group of consumers that need everything done for them, which is why Strong Roots exists in the first place. You know, we've always seen ourselves as the Sherpa for the consumer. You know, you be the hero, you climb the mountain, we'll um, we'll do all the hard work for you and we'll make you look good. So all of the convenience around Frozen is based on 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 um, on, on it being easy to do, which is one of the, the key pillars of our North Star. Yeah, very good. Um, so one of the things, you know, when I've spoken to, I guess, startups that are looking to make frozen frozen products and i think it's more a few companies who want to create say frozen ready meals for example uh i don't know a, a frozen burrito or or some sort of breakfast dish um and one of the things uh some uh, having spoken to some other investors has been about the supply chain especially if you're delivering it to the consumer so um, one is that obviously the packing and uh, the, the temperature has to be the right temperature, but the big one is also around logistics, obviously with the delivery yeah. trucks and all that. You've gone obviously um, direct to the retailers, um, but what's your opinion about more of the supply chain and delivery side, both within um, you know, the super large supermarket chains, but also people who are trying to create a, a direct consumer product that may be bigger, you know, boxes that may have more items within that box, sure. for example. Yeah, sure. Yeah, the supply chain question is very complicated, especially around around frozen. Um, you know, one thing I would say, and I don't have a number to share, but I'll follow up with you, is that... Um, the, the supply chain of, of shipping frozen food and the, the carbon that's used in that process specifically is dwarfed by food waste. So if we're to try and pick one over the other, the food waste problem is significantly larger than, than the, the shipping and supply chain problem on frozen food in particular. With things like D to C, it gets yes. more complicated. Um, you know, the main shipping channel of, of direct consumer frozen food is by carbon dioxide or dry ice. Um, there is no better shipping method for temperature control in that industry than um, carbon dioxide. And that's one of the reasons that we've been hesitant to jump in with two feet before understanding what the actual carbon impact is, because you know our objective is obviously to make food better and, and improve the food system and supply chain. If we jump into D2C without understanding what the actual relevance of um, change that that's going to create to our carbon footprint, it you know we could be swapping one thing for one one bad thing for another. Yes. So it's, com so was that, it's complicated. Was, so was that actually one of your um, decisions, or have you actually been considering also D2C? 
We, we are, and we're planning to actually launch a, a, a beta test in, in North America within the next six to 12 months. Um, we've been working on our proposition for the last couple of years. There's been a lot of market entrants serving various different consumer bases. And one of the things that we wanted to understand is where we fit, what's missing, what's the consumer proposition um, that no one else has tackled yet. Um, we think that's close to... Uh, uh, value and and convenience over doing meal replacement, but that's something we're we're still working out, and we're adapting lots of our products uh, portfolio in order to be able to to cater to what a holistic delivery package to a consumer looks like. The other thing that we're very conscious of, and it kind of led us to our B Corp certification a couple of years ago, is ultimately what our climate footprint is and if um i know you're you're based in the uk so if you go down to your local waitrose or uh, tesco you'll see some of our products now actually have our b corp logo on the front yeah but also our climate footprint on the front of the pack um mm. which i believe we're the first company to do in such an obvious um such an obvious manner lots of people are are, are now illustrating what their climate footprint is on back of pack we've decided to put it front and center. And the reason for that is, is because whether good or bad, we want to put it out there to, to make people understand that we're constantly trying to improve. So going from, you know, low density polyethylene to cars, understanding what the footprint effect of that is, and now looking at the D2C channel and understanding what, what we're putting into the supply chain by using carbon dioxide to ship the product and, you know, sometimes as a result of availability, you see a lot of the D2C companies starting off with compostable materials and things that are natural and things that can break down easy. But mm. during the pandemic, as I was testing all the various different uh, D2C channels, I started getting polystyrene, I got, started getting plastics, I started getting things because there is not enough resources to um, uh, deliver the amount of consumer demand that's out there. Yeah. So, and you've also got the cost, right? I mean, the cost of packaging for a brand that's a new entrant is, is going to be a lot cheaper going the other way than buying sustainable packaging. But I think if that's a core ethos of the company, it should it should be followed, shouldn't it? It should they and we should kind of be making it easier for startups to sort of afford to go the right way with also their packaging. Yeah, th this is this is, I suppose, a complete counter culture thing to say. But one of the reasons why we we've been able to lean into bricks and mortar retailers so much is because they're efficiently consolidating a location and a distribution channel for people to purchase um, large scale variety of products and food, uh, food beverage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and ultimately, that's how um, the industry moved at a time when people wanted more variety of, variety of things under the one roof. The huge disruption of that is obviously brands wanting to speak to um, their consumers directly and a whole supply chain being created in order for them to do that, but inefficiently relative to how efficiently various different big retailers have put a huge amount of effort and investment into building environmentally sustainable distribution centers and supply chains, et cetera. So as we invest in one thing, we're creating one another thing to basically be abrasive against it. And everyone's kind of trying to try to understand where the, um, you know, uh, catalyzing of uh, D2C during the pandemic is going. Is it stabilized? Is it continuing to grow? There's no doubt that e-commerce is becoming more and more prevalent and people are buying more, more and more online. But is it becoming efficient or less efficient as a result of how we're doing it? Now, obviously, frozen is an anomaly in that because of its energy usage in the supply chain. But a lot of ambient or dry goods and brands have benefited from skipping that step of the retailer. Um, but retail and the bricks and mortar environment has really worked for us because we're able to categorize how the consumer shop, what consumer discovery um, looks like, and, and ultimately having a relationship with um, 
and, and the data that comes with that relationship to understand where to go next. So it's a it's a good debate. <laughs> it's a difficult yeah. one. Yeah. Um, and th- staying on the on the big corp topic um yeah great great news obviously that you've you've got that status and also you mentioned there about the carbon labeling as well we need more consumer products to have uh the correct labeling on their products um can you just talk a little bit first of all just on the process to get the get the certification with with b corp sure um b corp is obviously a community of um uh companies and organizations who are for, focused on, you know, this idea of a triple bottom line. So people, planet and profit, um, three being equal elements in a company's development or the organization's development. The reason that's important to us um, is because since the beginning, certification or not, we always decided that we wanted to be a company who did things in the right way. Um, and that's because we're pushing and challenging big food to be better you know the goal is to improve the food system so therefore you know we're not over woke to that sense you've got to run a business you've got to use things that in order to get started are unsustainable because if you want scale you have to fall in line with the supply chains that exist but then as we got scale we wanted to do things better than everybody else so in year two or three we took the decision to um i suppose look at how we could join a community of other companies who were, in our view, doing business in the right way, which wasn't pure uh, capitalism, but what's been kind of coined as conscious capitalism. Which companies were you considering at that time? One of the kind of main flags for us would have been um, Oatly and how they were kind of, um, you know, positioning themselves as a brand that was conscious of, the effects that they were having on an industry. Um, For the longest time, I've been a huge advocate of um, companies like Innocent, which is how we built a lot of our product proposition on, who are one of the the bigger B Corp inclusions, particularly in Ireland, but also in the UK. And then if you look at even um, businesses like Kroger in the US, for example, large supermarket chains, um, who are looking at how to benefit the triple bottom line at the same time are all members of, of B Corp in different ways. I also have a, a, a small investment in a company called Feed that operates in the UK and Ireland. Yeah, a big he actually part came of from the show, by the way. Great guy. Shane's great. Shane, yeah. um, I'm speaking to him later on. We actually have a board meeting. But, Tell him um, I say hello. <laughs> I will indeed. Um, and one of the key reasons that um, I was interested in their company and helping them out is because of their same commitment so for me you know it's easy to see opportunities when you're in the food business you get a lot of opportunities to to look at and invest in companies and stuff but unless they're you know striving for the same thing it doesn't interest me so b corp has been important the process is by assessment so there's a big questionnaire and you fill out the questionnaire incredibly honestly uh you know it's, it's very difficult in the assessment not to state what your future hopes are for the company because it makes you realize what you're not and actually that's an important part of it Mm. um so you fill out the questionnaire and um uh i think the i can't remember what the baseline is um i think it's like 80 83 85 somewhere around there of of a point system which you must be over in order to apply for 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 certification and um for a lot of it, I think um, we had uh, sufficiently already established our company in the way it should be in terms of focusing on sustainability and our carbon footprint and the types of products that we sell ultimately are assistive in that whole process. The things I think that a lot of startups don't have is the diversity and inclusion elements. Um, you know, when you're building a, a startup, you're focused on growth and nothing else, you know, not a fairness and a quality element to how your organizational structure works. Um, you know, inclusion and diversity at board level, at senior executive level, making sure that people are healthy and well, is there enough time off? Have they been considered in terms of career development? So it really is a holistic 
view of how you run the business and a very, very positive forward-looking view of, uh, around which if a lot of companies did it, um, how commerce would be much more improved. Um, so it's an assessment followed by an audit and, and ultimately certification. And now um, recertification can happen, I think, every three or five years. I'm not um, up to date on my, on my B Corp rules. But one of the other things that we, we did to really kind of um, commit to the process well, that was actually uh, adopt uh, in our company constitution the commitment um, to, to, be, to be Corp and what it stands for. So the actual rules that govern the company from a board level um, have, have adopted um, legal inclusion as well. So we're kind of, awesome. we're actually bound by it, which is, uh, which is an important part for us, but also um, for our recent um, uh, new uh, investor and shareholder in McCain as well. Yeah. And we'll come to McCain in a minute. Um, are you using any um, specific tools to help you do your carbon reporting? Um, any technology tools, etc.? Yeah, there's a great company. Um, I think they're based in um, Sweden, but uh, it could be, I think they're based in Sweden. I stand to be corrected and apologies to them if they're not called Carbon Cloud. Um, Carbon Cloud is a cloud-based reporting system, basically, by which we use their tools and database to account for the amount of climate footprint there is on each product. So if you look at the metrics on the front of the packs uh, of our new products, that has all been ca calculated by Carbon Cloud. And the good thing about Carbon Cloud is it's also a database where you can go on and see any of the companies that are part of that program, you can go on and audit um, and compare and contrast where they sit. Um, so um, I know Oakley is another company who, who, who uses that, um, but uh, it's quite significant and uh, the team yeah. over there really, really helpful. Yeah, and they, they've had it for a long time. I, I've seen their packaging have that. So they have definitely been leading the way in, in terms of that, making that, reporting basically transparent to the consumers. Um, what can be done on, what I don't have is, I guess, a, a touch point on what the consumers are, are thinking and are they actually, are they now wanting to have this data available to them? Um, will it actually inform their future decisioning of purchasing certain products or not? Because that's what we should be driving towards, I guess. Yeah. The answer is it's a very, very, very small group of people, um, but ultimately growing. And um, the younger the generation of consumer is, the more interested they are in climate impact of their products. Um, and they are making choices on brands which are conscious of these topics. Um, but the reality is, is that it's still super, super, super small. But um, I think the same goes for veganism. You know, veganism has been a, uh, you know, hundreds of years process in the making of um, popular culture, which it's now at the absolute peak of. And I think, you know, there's always a good reason to keep banging the drum about why it's better to do this and why we should illustrate these things so that they eventually become normal state of play. Um, so while it is very small, it, it's still very, very important. Um, um, and we want to be part of the leadership that make it more obvious um, over a longer yeah. space of time. Yeah, and it also makes you more unique. Yeah, I mean, look, we, 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 there's no point in standing aside from the fact that it is part of our marketing strategy. It's part of who we want to be, but it's also part of how we want to connect with people. And it, what we want to first people to understand about our brand is that it tastes great. We're a taste first brand. Everything else comes after that. We have a six strong seeds strategy of how we develop products. And each of those, those, um, those points have to be met. One of which being sustainability um, and how we communicate about how we do things better. You know, we, we can't, we don't have vast um, vertically integrated agriculture projects and 
co-manufacturing facilities or sorry, manufacturing facilities that we can, I suppose, talk about the journey of, of the of the food, even though we have great, great partners that do. The difference that we make is uh, making brands work harder and better for planet people and, and ultimately leading to profit. Um, and that's our role, you know, in, in improving the food system. Yep. Awesome. And thinking about uh, McCain now, so you closed on your investment, which was, I think, one of the largest uh, food investments in Europe at, uh, was, was it 55 million US dollars or? That's right. That's yeah. right, yeah. Um, and so it's been uh, a few few months now since uh, you've you've got that investment. Can you tell us what what has changed? Like, what have you used that investment for? And as a result of getting that investment, it'd be great to hear a little bit more on the marketing side and what other areas you'll be investing for future growth. So we're currently in planning mode and uh, pretty much have been since we closed um, that investment round at the at the start of December last year. Um, I think one of the biggest investments that we've made so far is in people um, to put the foundation in for what will be a period of um, much more incremental growth for us. Um, the second biggest bucket of investment that we've made thus far is in um, R&D. Um, so we currently sit in, depending on what way the retailers cut it up, maybe two or three categories within frozen food. Um, and our outward sort of um, pipeline of products and categories is, is probably another seven on top of that over a kind of a five to 10 year period. Um, so we've been investing heavily in R&D to understand um, what comes next. Um, the next tranche of our investment is going to be in um, uh, specific regional uh, growth to back that pipeline. So um, we're obviously uh, still an emerging brand in the US market. We've got nationwide distribution with a number of chains uh, to date, I think nearly about 5,000 stores. We've also um, invested in um, uh, research on which other geographical territories that we're going to launch within the next couple of years. Yeah. Our, our objective alongside improving the food system is to globalize the brand and have it available for approximately 10% of the global population within the next five, five years. So we've got a lot of road to walk and um, ultimately that they're the three main areas where we'll be focusing on yeah. the internationalization of the brand people and R&D uh, for the most part. Yeah. So let's let's touch on the the, the big one, the, the people question. Um, which sort of departments and can you tell me a little bit more about, I, I guess, the senior leadership team as well within Strong Roots? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the we have a, a global strategy team um, which functions as um, uh, leadership for the business. Um, uh, it's myself, uh, my COO, Fergal McGarry, who's a, um, a lifelong career in CPG, CPG companies. Uh, Maria Kennedy, who's our group head of marketing, who is um, uh, formerly from the fashion industry, but has come over to the plant-based nice. food industry to try and use some of their their strategy and, yeah. um, and and ways of reach. You know, that's that's a, probably a good idea because you know some some of the best ads also when you look at like attention metrics are sort of luxury brand ads that are quite simple but just like really effective at standing out. Yeah. And like, uh, you know, animation and stuff like that to capture your eye. So, you know, maybe... I, I, I literally had the same conversation with our creative director. We've just brought a new creative director into the business, a lady called Ali Havlin, um, who comes from the beauty industry. And yeah. we, we had the same conversation, which was, uh, it all starts, you know, cultural trend and engagement all starts with fashion and beauty. So ultimately, you know, doing more like what they do brings you closer to emerging trend than everything else, which is just follow on copy or me too versions of that. So whether, whether it's color palette or photography style or, you know, um, just a new uh, uh, channel or way of, of promoting things, that, that's what they're designed for. So 
um, taking a leaf out of their book is, yeah. is what we're doing right now. I, I would probably add music as well to, to yeah, maybe that. Yeah. I mean, true. you true. know, <laughs> are they one of the same now? And that's a debate. Yeah, for, <laughs> yeah quite true. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, Maria comes from uh, comes to us from Coach and. Um, then uh, Hanno Dadenet, who's a, a, a Belgian guy who works for us as a head of product R&D, um, and our CFO, Chris Burke, will make up um, the global strategy team. And what we've been doing as a newly formed group pretty much since just since the start of the year is trying to pave out what comes next. What are the right decisions to make? Where should we try and, and win? And how do we want to do it at the same time as keeping our B core principles and making sure that we're doing it in the right way. Yep. And so let's talk about where you want to go next. Obviously you've got your, your range of, of frozen food. That's um, actually a huge number of uh, locations. You, you mentioned 5,000 uh, retail that's stores in, in the U S right. That's in the U S yeah, yeah. We're probably in around um, nine to 10,000 stores uh, as, as a group. Uh, yeah. ac- across the globe now. Could you mention your retailers that you're in today? Yeah, so the major retailers in Ireland are like Super Value Done Stores, Tesco, which obviously bridges over into the UK as well. Yeah. Um, we trade with most of the majors in the UK. We started with Waitrose, then moved to Tesco. Um, we were at Sainsbury's, Asda, Morrison's. Um, uh, we're just uh, about, we've done some business with Iceland in the past just about to do some more hopefully and we're very proudly the first frozen brand to go to Marks and Spencer shelves um they, they were previously not they were they were a private label specialist obviously up until a few years ago and you Amazing. know that was a big that was a big one for me because yeah Marks and Spencer has been a huge part of you know the fanciest place to go to do your shop for years and then uh, shortly after that, we actually ended up on the shelves of Harrods, uh, which was another um, anomaly for a frozen food brand, um, yeah. especially one that had come from from Dublin and Ireland. Um, across the US, uh, Walmart, Kroger, Whole Foods, uh, Wegmans, Fresh Market, Sprouts, the, you know, a lot in the national channel. I'm sorry to anyone who I'm leaving out. Um, but starting off in you know New York and Morton Williams and the small bodegas and um, Union Market in particular was our first listing in, in the US. Um, uh, Albert Hein in the Netherlands, Woolworths in Australia, Cronin in Iceland, um, Casino in France. Um, put me on the spot here. Whenever you start doing lists, yeah. it's the ones that you don't say that you're going to get um, in trouble for. Are you but... working on... Um... I'm thinking just just on France on Carrefour, for example. We we don't work with Carrefour in France yet, but we work with Carrefour in um, the UAE. Okay. Um, right. Yeah, in the UAE, we work with Carrefour and Spinneys and Waitrose, and um, we've got a number of um, um, uh, retailers that we exist with in Hong Kong and Singapore as well. Um, yeah. So and here- have been working out there for for a while. So this this might be a little bit of a controversial question. Don't um, ask it. <laughs> <laughs> when when do you think we'll see one of those big retailers, perhaps one of the ones that you're working with, go completely plant based, straight vegan? Um, I think that question depends on the consumer. I mean, the the big retailers are great at following what the consumer trend is because they have the data to understand what's important to their shopper base. And that's, that's what they exist to be, you know, to serve the consumer. If you look at Waitrose and Sainsbury's, for example, they've created a B Corp aisle because they know that that's important to their consumers. So can an aisle become a supermarket? Well, if the aisle or the section didn't exist before, then why not? Um, in terms of timing, uh, you know, I think it becomes about when things start getting complicated for us in terms of global temperature and lack of supply of specific things. Like, I mean, I haven't um, experienced it much, but I've been seeing photos from the team of the UK in particular after Brexit and during the pandemic with empty shelves of, of day-to-day items. Yeah. Um, I have 
two young children, one of which is is still using baby formula. And uh, even as someone in the food business, I'm currently looking in various different stores for the brand that myself and my wife use for him for baby formula. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, these things are warning signs of change. And, you know, unfortunately, we as a race of people don't do anything until it's right in front of us and causing a problem. And as the problems increase, hopefully it hit, hits home more. But um, change has been difficult in that respect because it hasn't been forced onto people. And um, I, I don't know what the timeline is. I think the sooner the better, obviously, is, is, is the right answer. But how it happens, yeah. I'm not sure. I mean, I'd like to see supermarkets become more visionary. Like, I guess my point, like, if you were, I don't know, going to ask Steve Jobs, if he was still alive, you know, what, what does a consumer want? They don't know what they want until you give them something. So in a way, it's still like, kind of like, they're only going to buy what, what's been marketed to them or yeah. what's on the shelves. Yeah. Um, one, of the big, one of the big supermarkets needs to make a decision on this, is yeah. my feeling. They, they really well, I, mean, I mean, if you look at this from an investment potential perspective, and I, this is a good example because I've seen him on your show, which is Veggie Grill, which is literally two doors down from our office here on, in, in Flat Art in New York. Um, there was no uh, vegan vegetarian options on this street or probably in the next three or four blocks other than you going into a deli and asking to the, for them to make you something specific. Yes. Since they've opened, there's five other chains <laughs> opened on our street <laughs> which awesome. cater to vegan vegetarian restaurants. Yeah. And they, they didn't exist before. And, and I think you're right, you know, if, if someone started a vegan supermarket, everyone would use it. And so I think it's a case of when and not how, because as the, the options on the main streets change, people are just adapting, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, your, your point that you made to me um, about uh, the Starbucks surcharge on plant-based milk right. um, uh, before our call, yeah. you know, that 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 isn't that great that that's a that's a debate and an argument because it didn't totally. exist before totally yeah, yeah. there was yeah. no option before and now there's seven plant-based milks and um, you yeah. know that's progress that's progress yeah and even like i'm just thinking near near where you are now in new york there's a shake shack uh, and now yeah. they they want to cater to um to the plant-based audience by offering their their milkshakes with plant-based milk um yeah. But yeah, that, I mean, that is a, that's an important point that we, we want to obviously transition uh, the, the traditional, you know, even like dairy uh, uh, companies, fast food companies to do that. Um, and we do need to follow because they're, at the end of the day, the consumers are going to be making the purchase decisions. But when you have a, a large supermarket chain that is, and this will come, I think this will lead us to the next question, which is around farming. You know, they're, they're paying the farmers, and in, in this scenario, it'll be if we're thinking of animal agriculture, that they're keeping their livelihoods going. But it's also a reason of why farmers can transition now to grow crops, to grow more vegetables, to grow oats for, for oat milk, and, and transition their animal farming, whether it's even, I don't know, a chicken coop into into growing mushrooms so yeah. we need a way of of this to happen and i feel that supermarkets have a role in this transition and it's not just the consumers mm-hmm. no definitely look it, it's a it's a it's a combined effort i'm not suggesting that um uh, everyone should just wait for each other to move um but um on the basis of how price sensitive um, shopping has become and, and the competitive nature between the chains. I don't blame the leadership for not taking the first step. You know what I mean? From a, from, a from one, from one yep. CEO to another, um, it's, it's almost, you know, falling on the sword to make progress happen. So I yeah. think, you know, and that's, and that's where they need a strong board, a strong board, plenty of cash reserves and the willingness to actually change. Um, yeah. You know, that those those commercial decisions are difficult to make. Um, you know, I've been at the at the, the top of the tree for some of those, and right. sometimes you have to make a difficult decision. And I guess that's what's also led the growth to now seeing 
vegan and plant-based online brands picking up, right? So obviously here in the UK, you've got the vegan kind. Uh, You've also now got a delivery service called Zebra here in the UK for plant-based deliveries like those other chains that are selling quick turnaround items. But also in in the US, you've got Veggie uh, as well, also in the Canadian market. Um, So they they started to grow and and there's definitely evidence in that the appetite for consumers is there. Um, let's, Let's talk about your farming background within the family that's been in the, you know, the agriculture industry. Um, so what, what did they say when you said to them that, you know, you're not eating meat and two veg, you're just going to have the two veg. <laughs> yeah. We, we, um, for any farmer that knows me that sees this, this is the first thing they'll say is he was never a farmer. And, and that's, <laughs> that's true. I've, I've grown up working in an agribusiness, um, working directly with farmers doing a lot of contract growing um, and being involved in the process. But just to be clear, you know, I'm, I'm I, the only time that I actually did any farming specifically was when uh, at the very start of this venture, David Flynn, uh, who's a, a great farmer out in Rush, which is a, an area in North County, Dublin, where um, it's got incredibly rich, sandy soil. Um, a lot of new crop potatoes and salad vegetables and stuff are grown in that region. It's kind of like Boston or Ely in, in, in the UK where they grow potatoes. He helped me grow sweet potatoes because I wanted to understand um, what the conditions were. Everything was being grown in North Carolina at the time. I wanted to see if we could grow um, a crop in Ireland outdoor. Um, there was another botanist uh, called Pat, Fitz- Pat Fitzgerald who helped us with the seeds and stuff for that. But ultimately, we proved that it just wasn't going to be possible and there wasn't enough glass houses to do it. So that's the extent of my farming background, just just to be just to be uh, honest about it. What I what I do know and understand is how products get made. And I mean, from the ground all the way to the consumer. And I think that's what's helped us get to where we are over a relatively short space of time. Um, And incredibly lean with a small team, as opposed to having to raise huge tracts of money and, um, you know, lots of consultants in order to do that. Um, from that comes a respect for products. So we've only ever worked with partners that have regenerative programs that aren't overusing the soil, are reusing water, are turning their vegetable waste into biogas in order to power the compressors for energy and making decisions, you know, including uh, McCain, who are um, who have this incredible goal of being um, carbon neutral and completely sustainable by I think it's uh, 2030 or 2035. I'm not quite sure. I can't remember. But the the um, the goals and the the route to get there for a company of that size, you know, means a huge amount of pl- planning and a critical path that can actually do it. Um, so we've always worked with partners that also get it. Um, like there's lots of times where I've gone into co-manufacturing facilities because we don't make our own things. We design them, we bring them to someone else and they make them for us with our guidance. Um, we've got agronomists on the payroll. We've got engineers on the payroll, but um, they can only guide and direct um, the people who are actually doing it. And we've gone into these facilities and, you know, not only is there no food safety, but it's just about if I make enough, I can make the profit. And those companies are already unsustainable and failing. And I don't mean failing from a sustainability perspective. I mean, from a business perspective, mm. if, if, if you're not thinking about how you can tick all of those boxes and you're not resourced and capitalized to do it, it's only a matter of time before, you know, um, uh, the business uh, has to cease for you because for anyone who's setting up manufacturing facilities or agriculture facilities that are not thinking this way are only going to last a couple of seasons. And then, you know, where the soil comes in, the increase in demand for consumption is constant. You know, we're trying to get to a point where feeding 9 billion people at 2050 needs to be sustainable. And in order to do that, we need to have sustainable crops that are not taking from the planet health, but actually helping 
sequester things like um, uh, carbon dioxide from the environment. The reality is, is that the, the, the easiest way to do that, and I know you've seen the great documentary called Kiss the Ground, Ground. Yep. Um, which goes into detail on this, is, is essentially by growing plant crops that can help. You know, leaving um, uh, crops in the ground, less tilling, less water usage, um, and ultimately more soil health, which means that we need to use less land to grow more volume to feed more people. And like, it's incredibly simple, but the practices that are going on in the agriculture community because of the lack of education are the opposite to this. Yeah. Um, and, and that's amazing to say because it's been done for, you know, farming has been done for so long and most of the people in farming are multi-generational families. But the reality is, is that resources are being drained and we have to, we have to fix that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as you said, a big advocate for, Buyer sequestration of, of 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 carbon dioxide by simply getting people to eat more veggies and thus having more plants on the ground. It, it sounds ridiculously simple, but that's that's what we need to do. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah, we were speaking about uh, kiss the ground. So if anyone hasn't watched that, it's definitely a good documentary to watch that explains effectively when you're plowing the land, you're also um, letting off the emissions that have been captured in the soil. Whereas you can get certain machinery, which is slicing, if you like, um, channels at a certain angle where the water can seep through and then uh, natural water can, can go into land and then you don't have these dry patches of land. So um, it's a great documentary for anyone who hasn't seen that, but, and, and, and it was great to talk to you about that as well. Let's uh, speak about soil health. So obviously, you know, there's also been some documentaries around rewilding and how animal grazing and then also them with their like cow manure, you know, going into yeah. the ground is beneficial for the ground and for soil health. What's your views on that? Um, and especially for me, it's also something that I consider when I'm buying soil. Like, mm -hmm. should I buy vegan soil that doesn't have crushed bones or feathers for, for nitrogen, for example, for, for, yeah. for the soil. So what are your views on those two areas, the, the, the sort of the rewilding aspect of animal grazing um, and that soil health, but also having organic soil that is also vegan that doesn't include uh, byproducts from animals? Big believer in rewilding um, um, for... Uh areas that can sustain it and that can also have the circular economy of uh, the animal inclusion. Obviously, we don't need to let everything go wild and have an unsustainable mass manufacturing capability for the provision of food. Um, it won't work if it's all that way, um, unless people eat completely seasonally, which is another huge education piece um, that people have moved away from historically as opposed to toward. Correct, yeah. um, I've actually had some amazing conversations with um, the guys at Wild Farmed, um, which is a rewilding project, ultimately creating a incredibly high quality flour that's been used in a number of uh, French and, and London bakeries, uh, which was set up by um, Andy Cato. And I've had some great on conversations with them in the last year or so about what they're trying to do and how it could possibly be done on a wider scale in a bigger environment uh, like the US. Mm. Um, when it comes to the need for nitrogen, I think it's completely necessary for the use of animal waste. Again, back to that circular economy. Um, there's no uh, I, I, bones, feathers, different conversation, but the use of fertile animal waste in order to naturally fertilize and encourage growth i think is something that you know it yeah. has always been in existence but you to choose to do it in a less than ethical way is a different conversation yes yeah, so. that's what i was going to touch on like w would you see um you know having that come from a big uh, producer factory farm uh from from animals and that waste coming from there or are you really saying well if they're you know for example, organic cattle 
Um, I, I think I think the answer is I think the answer is we can make it ourselves, right? You know, yeah. um, I think uh, there's there's enough there's enough, uh, um, uh, but it, you know, depending on what your circumstances are, this is something that can be made relatively easily um, from um, from composting and um, from your local farm if you wanted to get uh, enough of it. Uh, probably for free in most cases to to, to do that yourself. Mm. Um, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't suggest that. Um, you know, large uh, large factory um, large factory farming of animals is is ultimately beneficial to to what we're all trying to achieve here to to, to move towards plant based. Mm. But ultimately, we're also trying to you know our sort of company philosophy is not to the erad- the eradication of anything. It's about eating more veggies as opposed to trying to remove things from your diet because we want to be realistic about what type of a gateway that we can become for plant-based consumption um so the increased consumption of veggies is what we're about as opposed to the eradication of it um i'm not uh personally growing um anything out our back because we don't have enough room but i think personal composting is probably the answer if it's something that's you know individually anyone's having an issue with yeah going to now you know future products for you so obviously you 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 know you're working really hard and doing really well to conquer the the frozen food aisle with with your veggies and and different types of products what product range are you thinking of next uh it's a great question um we have a number of things on um on our uh a pipeline that are going to launch later this year so at the start of h2 um we're going to move into a new category for us uh, which is what's traditionally called in america as single serve entrees um in the uk they'd be better known as ready meals um we have developed a, a range of um uh, uh vegan um ridiculously tasty uh nutritious you know great source of protein, fiber, um, products that are completely clean. Um, when we say clean, we mean without any unnatural products whatsoever, which still tastes really delicious. And we've achieved the taste by using, um, natural, natural, uh, natural seasonings, the sugars and the tastes and the textures that are coming from the various vegetables and the products, um, are basically doing all of the work of all of the seasonings that you would normally find in kind of over-processed food. Um, so the, the first two SKUs that we're launching in Whole Foods uh, na- uh, nationally in the US are our Thai green veg curry. Oh, great. And we have a Greek orzo uh, pasta bake. And great. we're getting, you know, the savory tastes from roasted cherry tomatoes and using coconut creams in replacement of dairy products. Yeah. And for all of the, the sweetness or any of the, the, the spice, we're just using completely natural ingredients, of which you'd be amazed is incredibly difficult when you're trying to mass manufacture products, mostly because most factories are now using so many allergens and using so many ingredients in food instead of trying to really simplify them down. Mm. to make a basic proposition of stuff that already tastes good. Um, it's amazing how overcomplicated the cooking process has become in mass manufacturing to the point where, you know, everyone's using stabilizers or loads of salt or loads of sugar to make things taste great. And we think we've cracked it without having to use any of that. So uh, those two products go live. There's another four products that will follow those up in the U.S. market. And we're currently investigating whether that's going to be a, 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 the next proposition for the UK and Irish markets as well. Yeah. Um, so we're really excited about those. And what that does is it, it gives us the potential to disrupt a massive industry in the US. You know, we want to continue to be a challenger brand. And one of the biggest places that, in our opinion, hasn't been innovated in at least the last 20 years properly is that 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 entree or, or ready meal aisle um, re, with really tasty but really healthy and clean at the same time um, and and balanced nutrition. 
Um, so we're going to start with kind of meal centers, things that you would eat at lunchtime or dinner. Um, but we're also going to look at breakfast and snacking and, you know, um, post gym protein moments and everything else that goes with it. Um, so yeah, we're really excited about, uh, that, that new meal for one category um, with those two products launching soon. Sounds great. Uh, we, I will look forward to try them. Uh, maybe when I'm next in, in the US or um, in the UK, depending on which products you're launching here. We'll send you some before. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As long as you package it in an environmentally friendly way, then that's cool. <laughs> It's been a big part of, uh, of the decision process. You know, we're trying to figure out whether completely compostable card, which is ultimately really strained from a supply source at the moment. And oh, right. Obviously, cutting down too many trees is not what our objective is. Yeah. One of the, weirdly, one of, one of the most circular supply chains that we've come across specifically is with uh, PET. So plastic, but the right density for constant recycling over and over again up to 15 times so you know trying to make those decisions about what goes into the supply chain has been a huge part of the r&d normally we turn things around in you know six months this has taken about 24 yeah actually i was reading about that as well uh is it pha is that something else Another four. Oh, don't, don't, don't put me on the spot. Yeah. Okay. I know. Yeah. I know. I know a lot of the letters, but not all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Me either. Um, all right, Sam. Um, this has been a pleasure talking with you, and um, yeah, you, you've done so much great stuff. We're really looking forward to seeing um, the new products that you're bringing to market, um, and just getting more consumers to eat whole foods as, as much as we can. Uh, and um, yes, yeah, exciting range of flavors that you start to introduce to get to more scale. Um, and uh, yeah, I want to see you in a lot more markets and then hopefully get you back on the show to tell us all the progress that you've made. I'd love that. Thanks for having me on. It's been really great chatting with you. Awesome. Thanks very much and see you again soon. See you soon. Take care. Bye.